Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome, and welcome to you all who are going to be listening on the radio, and also for those on the internet. We just invite you all to be here with us. And uh, of course, Lord, we invite you to here be to be here with us, Lord, right in our midst as we study your word, as we lift you up in worship, Lord. It's, it's all about you, Lord, not about us. We pray that you would take pleasure as we do lift you up and praise you. Be with us, Lord, through this entire service, Lord, whether we be up here on the worship team, teaching, out in the sanctuary, listening, learning, and the children back in the Sunday school. We ask your total blessing on this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And morning, everyone. If we can open up our Bibles this morning, we are going to read from Psalm 35 this morning, where we are told this through inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Plead my cause, O Lord, with those who strive with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for my help. Also draw out the spear and stop those who pursue me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Let those be put to shame and brought to dishonor who seek after my life. Let those be turned back and brought to confusion who plot my hurt. Let them be like chaff before the wind and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Let their way be dark and slippery, and let the angel of the Lord pursue them. For without cause they have hidden their net for me in a pit, which they have dug without cause for my life. Let destruction come upon him unexpectedly, and let his net that he has hidden catch himself, into that very destruction, let him fall. And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord, it shall rejoice in his salvation. All my bones shall say, Lord, who is like you, delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him. Yes, the poor and the needy from him who plunders him. Fierce witnesses rise up, they ask me things that I do not know. They reward me evil for good to the sorrow of my soul. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting, and my prayer would return to my own heart. I paced about as though he were my friend or brother. I bow down heavily as one who mourns for his mother. But in my adversity they rejoiced and gathered together. Attackers gathered against me, and I did not know it. They tore at me and did not cease. With ungodly mockers at feasts, they gnashed at me with their teeth. Lord, oh, how long will you look on? Rescue me from their destructions, my precious life from the lions. I will give you thanks in the great assembly. I will praise you among many people. Let them not rejoice over me who are wrongfully my enemies, nor let them wink with the eye who hate me without a cause. For they do not speak peace, but they devise deceitful matters against the quiet ones in the land. They also opened their mouth wide against me and said, Aha! Aha! Our eyes have seen it. This you have seen, O Lord. Do not keep silence, O Lord. Do not be far from me. Stir up yourself and awake to my vindication, to my cause, my God, and my Lord. Vindicate me, O Lord, my God, according to your righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, Ah, so we would have it. And let them not say, 
We have swallowed him up. Let them be ashamed and brought to mutual confusion who rejoice at my hurt. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor who exalt themselves against me. Let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. And let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And my tongue shall speak of your righteousness and of your praise all the day long. Amen. So this morning we're going to be continuing our study in the book of Ephesians chapter 5. This is where I left off last time. You know, I don't get up here that often because Joe is always here. But when he does go on vacation or on a missions trip, I fill in for him. In review... Last time we ended our study, Paul was discussing Christian marriage. This study of marriage began in chapter 5, verse 22, where Paul told everybody, us, everybody's favorite verse on marriage. And do you know what it is? Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. We learn that submission does not imply inferiority. A man is not better or more valuable than a woman. The scriptures record in the book of Genesis that God created Adam first and made him the Lord over creation. He was given the stewardship of the garden, and he was tasked with naming all the animals. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field, but for Adam... There was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And the man said, Wow! Can you imagine the woman that God fashioned perfect in every look and proportion? And he, knowing Adam, knew what Adam liked. And Adam, wow, I'm sure he was blown away. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. This is how it was in the beginning, when God set up the order of the human family. The institution of marriage is for a man and a woman only. Same-sex marriages and intimate relationships outside of marriage are forbidden. They are an abomination before God. Our modern society may legitimize promiscuous sex, homosexuality, same-sex unions, and more. But to God, they are perversions and gross sin. That's the way it is. Woman was created to be a suitable companion for man and was physically a part of the man because... She was made from his rib. The man was to be the spiritual head. And uh, let's face it, you know, whether you're on your job or anything else, somebody's got to be in charge. Somebody must be ultimately responsible for the decisions made within the family or what's going to happen. Divisions, fighting, chaos. Kind of like Congress. The scriptures tell us that this is to be the husband. I'm sure we have all heard of the war of the sexes. This war began in the Garden of Eden. After the fall, and it continues to our day. It's the result of both the man and the woman wanting to be in charge. And they want to have their own way. We learned that the submissive relationship between a husband and wife 
is not to be like that of a master and a slave or where one is superior to the other. Not supposed to be that way. To submit means that you recognize someone has legitimate authority over you. It means you recognize that there is an order of authority and that you are part of the unit, part of the team. You as an individual are not more important than the working of the unit or the team. When we submit to God, we recognize God's authority and act accordingly. When we submit to the police, we recognize the authority of the police and we act accordingly. And if not, where do you go? You end up in the clink. When we submit to our employee, employer, we recognize the authority of our employer and we act accordingly. Submission does not mean inferiority. As well, submission does not mean silence. Doesn't mean be quiet. Submission means submission. There is a mission for the Christian marriage, and that mission is obeying and glorifying God. The wife says, I'm going to put myself under that mission. That mission is more important than my individual desires. I'm not putting myself below my husband. I'm putting myself below the mission God has for our marriage and for my life. In the marriage relationship, the wife is to submit to the husband. The husband's part in this is that they are to love their wives. That sounds easy, huh? Uh, let me add this part. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, husbands must continually decide to practice self-denial for the sake of of their wives. Men are to practice this love. They are to be just like Christ who loved the church and he gave himself for her. He died for the church. He gave everything. Like Jesus, we men should be willing to even die for our wives. This is the pattern for biblical marriage. Now we're going to start with new material. In chapter 5, verses 30 through 33. Where we, will, where we will now be studying the mystical marriage relationship between Christ and his bride, the church. You know, I kind of have, sometimes when I think of myself as a bride, I don't know, woo, you know, it just doesn't sit right. But maybe this, these scriptures here, when we go through them, will make it a little bit more clear like it is, because I'm, as a man, I don't like to think of myself as a bride. I just, ooh, it's icky. Because we are members of his body, for this reason... A man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Paul here tells us that we Christians are a physical part of the body of Christ. Just as God formed the first woman from Adam's rib, and she was literally a physical part of him, so too the Christian is a physical part joined to Christ. Paul takes us way back to the book of Genesis chapter 2, where God sets up the human marriage relationship. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. As Eve, the first woman, was first taken from Adam, is literally God made her from his rib and then brought to him and they were joined together by God in the first marriage relationship. So too every married man today is joined to his wife. This joining is performed by God through the marriage ceremony. Guzik put it like this. It shows a fundamental principle for promoting oneness in marriage, there must be a leaving of former associations. Remember the scripture says a man should leave his father and his mother. 
and a cleaving joining together as one with his wife and, sh and shall be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So that's, that's the biblical pattern. Paul tells us that this is a great mystery as he relates human marriage to the mystical marriage that is true of the Christian church and individual believers, be they male or female. When they, through belief and faith in Jesus, the Son of God, are married and joined to Christ. The commentator Lloyd-Jones puts it like this. This is true in regard to the pattern of the first man and the first woman. One woman was made at the beginning as the result of an operation which God performed upon the man when he took out his rib. How does the church come into being? As the result of an operation which God performed on the second man, his only begotten beloved son, Jesus, on Calvary's hill. A deep sleep fell upon Adam. A deep sleep fell upon the Son of God. He gave up the ghost. He expired. And there in that operation, the church was taken out. As the woman was taken out of Adam, so the church is taken out of Christ. The woman was taken out of the side of Adam. And it is from the Lord's bleeding, wounded side that the church comes. This shows us that Jesus wants more than just an external surface relationship. He wants us to be one with him. Adam needed Eve to become one with him to make himself whole. So too Jesus needs us to become one with him because he is incomplete without us. In Ephesians 1 verse 23, it says of the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Spurgeon, Spurgeon put it like this. It shows the common connection of unity and oneness in the two relationships. Unity marks you for that is the essence of the marriage bond. We're all one with Christ who made himself one with his people. In verse 33, Paul tells us, nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. In this verse, Paul realizes that he had been teaching about two different aspects of marriage at the same time. First, about the human marriage between a man and a woman, and a second, about the mystical marriage between Christ and the church. Paul begins this verse with the word, nevertheless. Because he wants to shift the focus back to the main to topic, which is human marriage. So Paul just kind of took a little bit of a detour there and mixed the two of them together just so he could maybe be confusing us a little bit. Although I'm sure he didn't want to confuse us, but some of the writings there, Paul, can be hard to understand. Even the scriptures say that. Everyone is included in this, both men and women. We are to strive to carry out and obey the biblical mandate for marriage. Paul is in effect saying we already covered this ground. That's why he said nevertheless, but I'm going to say it again. Men are to love their own wives as themselves, just as Christ gave himself for the church. You husbands should be willing to sacrifice even your own lives for your wife. And for the woman's part, they are to submit to their husbands and give him the respect that he is due. Unity in marriage is what is important. Lloyd-Jones remarked, unity is the central principle in marriage, and it is because so many people in this modern world have never had any conception of what is involved in marriage at least from the standpoint of unity. 
they are clinging so loosely to it and breaking their vows and pledges so that divorce has become one of the major problems in our age. And I could add to that even in the church. They have never caught sight of this unity. They are still thinking in terms of their individuality. And so you have two people asserting their rights. And therefore you get clashes and discord and separation. The answer to all that Paul says is to understand this great principle of unity. Wives are to submit and be respectful to their husbands. The wife is to treat her husband with deference. In other words, she is to recognize this biblical and Christian view of marriage. She is to regard the husband as her head, the head of this new unit. They are both one, but there has to be a head to the unit, just as there is a head to our body, as Christ is the head of the church. The husband is given the position of dignity, leadership, and headship, and responsibility. And if he understands what it means, he will never abuse it. He will never misuse it by being harsh or dictatorial or unfair or unkind. To be guilty of such behavior is a denial of the marriage principle and means that there is an absence of the spirit. We must let this principle govern us. When a husband thinks, I'm one with my wife, and I must think and act that way. And a wife thinks, my husband is the head of our oneness, and I need to respect and defer to him as the head. If you do this, then you will have a healthy biblical marriage. And if not, Now we're going to continue in chapter 6, in verses 1 through 3, where Paul is next going to teach on another facet of submission, that of the parent-child relationship. Mickey remarked before study that we have already studied about this relationship when Pastor Joe gave his famous demon locust from hell sermon on Mother's Day a few years back. <laughs> but it's not so bad. <laughs> Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Here Paul quotes the fifth commandment and the promise that it contains. It boils down to this. Children are to obey their parents. Children must be taught to obey through discipline. Disobedience is no problem. As we are all born with a fallen human nature, with a natural inclination to sin and disobedience. Can I get a witness? It's done, it is the parent's job to teach the obedience. This is done by punishing disobedience. Young children may not understand why they are being disciplined, and they certainly will not like it. But even though they do not understand or want to cooperate, it's essential to discipline to correct bad behavior. This is so that obedience and good behavior can be learned. Lack of or inconsistency with discipline will result in having a child that is unruly, uncontrollable, what we sometimes call a brat. To sum it up, disobedience must be punished so that obedience can be learned. Children are to obey their parents in the Lord. This obedience is part of a child's Christian duty, much the same as the wife's Christian duty is to respect and submit to her husband. 
and the husband to love his wife. If anything else need be said, it's only right and proper that a child should obey their parents. You know, they came from you. You're taking care of them. It's only right that they listen to you and cooperate. It's just making it happen. That's the problem. <laughs> We're told to honor our father and our mother. This commandment is not just for children, but is equally relevant to adults. Children are to honor their parents through their obedience to them. Honor and respect is owed to parents because of their position and rank in the family. They provide and care for the children, lovingly guiding and nurturing them. As adults, we are no longer required to obey our parents. But we are still to honor them for the part that they have had in our birth and our upbringing. Just think of all the sacrifices along the way your parents made for you. And there's also the love aspect of the parent-child relationship that draws you to want to respect and honor your parents. Honoring your father and mother comes with a promise so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. When children no longer honor their father and their mother, family life is greatly disrupted. Folks said this, when the bonds of family life break up, when respect for parents fails, the community becomes decadent and will not live long. Just think of the chaos it's going to be. Kids just going out and doing what they want to do, not listening to their parents. We see it in our society, and it's falling apart. Paul continues in verse 4. Fathers... Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Parents can definitely provoke their children to wrath. This can be through harsh discipline, being overly critical, teasing, or being unkind. And I'm sure there's more ways too. Christian parents should never treat their children like this. As we are all born with a sin nature that gravitates to rebellion, parents must be careful not to further incite this natural sinful rebellion. The parent is to have a loving, understanding attitude that nurtures and guides their children as they discipline them. Now I'm sure that all you parents have had times when you failed to properly discipline your children. Perhaps you administered a harsh punishment or said something cruel in the heat of the moment. Instead of allowing yourself to cool down and think things through, you may have reacted in anger. I think we've all done that, huh? Let's face up. Lloyd-Jones said this, when you are disciplining a child, you should have first controlled yourself. Cool down. What right have you to say to your child that he needs discipline when you obviously need it yourself? Now, most of you who know me know I love the old TV show, Leave it to Beaver. It's my favorite. Back in, back in before the world was totally insane. On this show, Ward Cleaver, the father, is almost always the one who administers discipline to his sons, Wally and the Beave. There are several episodes that the parents, in their haste to discipline, get it wrong. When Ward and June discovered what's really going on, they get together and cooler heads prevail, and they lovingly correct their attitude and any undue punishment that was given out. Ward and June then go off privately by themselves, and they discuss together who learned more from that situation, the boys or themselves. See, we as parents, we have a lot to learn too. Those were the days. As Christian fathers, it is your responsibility to bring your children up with proper discipline 
and admonish them in the proper path of righteousness. Fathers are to be a spiritual example to their children. The children's spiritual upbringing is not to be just for the mother to do or by dropping them off at Sunday school and going, that's taken care of. As parents, we need to teach our children and discipline them in righteousness when necessary. There's nothing more important than this to the life and interaction of the family. We need to bring up our children by nurturing their body, mind, and soul. By care and great pains. And Calvin translated this part saying, it's, let them be fondly cherished. That should be your attitude to your children. Let them be fondly cherished. Continuing now with verses 5 through 8. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, render service. As to the Lord, and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he's free or he's slave. Now in Paul's day, there were many slaves throughout the Roman Empire. Lots of them. There may have been more slaves than there, were, than there was Roman citizens. Molay said, the gospel found slavery in the world and in many regions, particularly the Roman and the Greek. It was a very bad form of slavery. The gospel began at once to undermine it, which it's, with its mighty principles of the equality of all souls in the mystery and dignity of manhood and of the equal work of redeeming love wrought for all souls by our Supreme Master. But its plan was not to batter, but to undermine. So while the gospel, in one respect, left slavery alone, it doomed it in another. You know, Jesus didn't rise up, or Paul didn't say, slaves rise up, revolt against your master, even if he was cruel and unjust. He did not come against slavery. But the gospel in and of itself, though there was no big fight or revolution, the gospel undermined slavery. And the gospel was ultimately responsible for the abolition of slavery, at least in the Western world. In our society, we no longer openly have slaves. You know, at least not that I know of. I know we hear about children being sex slaves and stuff like that, and I don't know much about that or the extent of it. It's, it's, apparently it's pretty bad, but we don't openly have slaves and say, okay, slavery's fine. But these verses will also apply to those of us who hold a job and work for a living. We are to be obedient to our bosses and those who have positions over us. We are to work with sincerity just as if we are directly serving Christ because we are. The jobs we do are not to be done, done well only for eye service. That is, when the boss is looking and then when he's not looking, you're goofing around. Nor should we be working only with the goal of pleasing men. Our lives are, on, are an open gospel. How you work is a witness to what you believe. Christians should have a cheerful attitude and not be a complainer. The work that you do when you are doing is service to Christ and not men. Amen. Christian workers should have an attitude of goodwill towards their employers and their work. That's sometimes tough, isn't it? 
depending on your boss. But that's what the scriptures call us to do. It should be said of every Christian that he or she is a hard worker and gives his employer or her employer a full day's work for their pay. To do anything less is to steal from your employer. Everything in regards to your job should be done as to the Lord. Spurgeon said this, As to the Lord means that all of our work is really done unto the Lord, not unto man. Grace makes us the servants of God while we are still the servants of men. It enables us to do the business of heaven while we are attending to the business of earth. It sanctifies the common duties of life by showing us how to perform them in the light of eternity and heaven. We are to know and understand that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether we're free or slave, or whether you're a worker or a business owner. God will bless us and recompense us for a job well done. As we prove ourselves to be diligent and a hard worker, we're going to be blessed. We're going to be advanced in our position and we'll become prosperous. That's the normal course of things here in the, in the world. In verse 9, Paul tells us how employers need to treat their workers well. And masters do the same things to them and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven. And there's no partiality with him. Employers are to treat their employees kindly and fairly, just as the worker is to serve his employer. The employer must also serve their employees, working hard and honestly on their behalf. Employee, employers should not threaten their employees <coughs> or treat them harshly. God, who judges all, has no partiality, and he will judge everyone without regard to your wealth or your position. So, a commentator said this about this last part. The gospel leaves its message of absolute equal obligation in Jesus Christ upon the slave and upon the slave owner, upon the employer and the employee. The principal will do its own work. There is no word of revolution to rebel, either for the master or the slave. But the gospel did, in effect, end slavery eventually, as it changed and transformed the world. Paul has now finished up with his instructions on how to live a spirit-filled life. And in verse 10, he now calls on us to stand against the devil and to fight against the darkness of this life. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Paul uses the word finally in this verse because throughout this letter he has taught us about our place in Jesus and our Christian walk. For Paul to write finally here means that he speaks in light of all that he has previously said and taught through the, throughout this book. In light of all that God has done for you, in light of the glorious standing you have as a child of God, in light of his great plan of the ages that God has made you a part of, in light of the plan for Christian maturity and growth that he gives you, in light of the conduct God calls every believer to live, in light of the filling of the Holy Spirit and our walk in that spirit, in light of all this, yet there is a battle to fight in the Christian life. Amen? Amen. This battle is a spiritual battle. Look at the craziness we see going on in the world today. Look at the insanity 
about what's going on in Israel against Hamas and Israel. The world has turned it around and made Israel the villain over these horrible terrorists. Look at the, look at the brains full of mush on our college campuses coming against Israel and going, you know, from the river to the sea, Palestine must be free, which means all the Israelites got to go out of here. It's crazy, and it's a spiritual battle. We're going to cover it more fully later, but quoting from verse 12, Paul says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of the sage, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. To be effective in this battle, one must first be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. To be strong in the Lord means to be full of faith, relying on him to empower you as you step out and do the work that he has called you to do. As a Christian, there are no interested bystanders. We are all called to be Christian soldiers, warriors, and engage in the battle. We are to be strong, and this strength comes from God. God has vast reservoirs of might that he can be realized, that can be realized as power in our Christian life. But his might does not work in me as I sit passively, right? His might works in me as I rely on it and step out to do the work. I can rely on it and do no work, right? Just sit back, kick back, have a cup of coffee. I can do work without relying on it. How does that work out for you? Trying to do it in your flesh. Both of these approaches are no good. They fall apart. Jesus told his disciples in Mark chapter 11, verses 22 through 24, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and he does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they will be granted you. Now, is anything too hard for God? If he can create the universe out of nothing, no big bang, he didn't need a big bang, he spoke it, and it happened. No, God has an endless supply of might and power, and that power is available to the believer who exercises it in faith. Now, there's also a little bit caveat on here that it's got to be in the will of God. You know, I don't say, hey, I want this and cast this mountain in the sea just because it's blocking my view of the sunset, right? But, you know, if there was a good reason for it to happen and it's in the will of God, it's going to happen. Might works in me as I rely on it and step out to do the work. In verse 11, Paul instructs us to put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the scheme of the devil. When a soldier is sent out to battle, they are first prepared by basic military training. Any of you guys or gals who went through the service, what's the first thing you do when you join the military? You've got to go to boot camp. You've got to go to your, your basic training. And there, after that, they're equipped with the best equipment or armor possible. Only then can they be effective against the enemy. The armor of God is not physical, but it is effective armor nonetheless. The might of God and the power of God that the Christian has access to in combination with clothing ourselves with the armor of God makes us very capable and formidable warriors. 
Jesus defeated all power and principalities and disarmed them through his death on the cross. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, Paul writes, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Remember, you know, Satan thought he won when Jesus was crucified. He thought he'd won. He made, you know, he incited the Jews and the Romans to kill God himself, the Son of God, Jesus. He thought he won. But God was just displaying them and openly triumphed over them through his death and resurrection. And Satan realized that probably pretty soon after the death of Jesus Christ, that he hadn't won, he had lost it all. God himself is a source of and provides the armor. As we enter spiritual warfare for the sake of the kingdom, Jesus shares his spiritual armor with us, equipping us with everything that we need to be victorious when we are equipped with God's armor, we are invincible just like him. And let me ask you, how do we enter into this warfare? What do we do? There's a one-word answer. It's prayer. Prayer is the answer. And I'm just going to say this. I would sure like to see more of you guys and gals come for our prayer meetings we have on Saturday mornings. They're sometimes pretty sparsely attended and... That's our fight. Also, we just had praise, prayer, and worship on uh, Thursday nights. That's not like a free pass to, oh, I'm not going to be taught by Pastor Joe, so I'm not going to come. There's a lot of warfare that goes on there, and it is very important. i got to be honest, I get more out of you know pray, praise, prayer, and worship than I get out of a great teaching by Pastor Joe. So I'm going to encourage you guys to come. So Jesus shares his spiritual armor with us, equipping us with everything that we need to be victorious. When we are equipped with God's armor, we are invincible, just like him. In Romans 8, 35 through 39, Paul said this, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of Christ, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's, we're invincible warriors. If we have faith and we put on the armor of God, we're invincible. Nothing can touch us. No created thing. Putting on the armor of God is absolutely necessary because without it, we'll fall prey to the devil and his minions. Guzik said this, we express the strength we have in God by standing against the wiles of the devil. Satan's schemes against us come to nothing when we stand against them in the power of God. The tactics of intimidation and insinuation alternate in Satan's plan of conquest and his campaign. He plays both the bully and the beguiler. Force, fraud, and temptation form his chief offensive against us, against the saints. I previously briefly talked about verse 12. Now we're going to dig into it a little bit deeper. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Our warfare is a spiritual warfare. 
It began long ago in heaven when the beautiful and mighty archangel Lucifer rebelled against God and sin first entered the universe. Lucifer, you know what that name means? Star of the morning. Isn't that a beautiful name? But we, you know, it's got an evil connotation now, but his name, Lucifer, is, is beautiful. It's got, you know, star of the morning. That's cool. And he was the most, the scriptures say, he was the most beautiful thing God ever created. Lucifer, the archangel, was perfect and blameless in every way until unrighteousness was found in him. Pride was the cause of his corruption, and pride was his downfall. You know, we all know the saying, pride comes before a fall. This may be the origin, where it originated, and it surely is true in our own lives as well. He was puffed up with his abilities, his appearance, his wisdom. Who's like me, he thought. As Isaiah tells us in chapter 14, he said in his heart five fatal I will statements. They were, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars, which are the angels of God. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Now remember, Lucifer was created. This is the original source of all sin and rebellion in God's perfect creation. It precedes the fall in the Garden of Eden. This happened, who knows, you know, there probably was no time at this time because time is a function of a mass energy universe like we live in, like we see this as being solid and real. In reality, this is nothing more than a very loose conglomeration of atoms held together by electromagnetic force. And gravity and time are functions of what we call real, but not so in the heavenly realm. So we don't know how long heaven existed and Lucifer existed before he rebelled. The book of Revelation of Jesus Christ reveals to us in chapter 12 that Lucifer was not alone in his rebellion, but he was joined by one-third of the holy angels. Lucifer and the third of the angels that followed him in rebellion are the rulers, the powers, the world forces of darkness, and the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places that we're fighting against through spiritual warfare. In our flesh, we can do nothing, nothing to them. The scriptures say even Michael, the archangel, doesn't dare to issue a, a, a railing accusation against them. But he says, may God rebuke you. So we're as nothing to these things without God's protection and God's armor. We'd be a crispy critter that quick. God in his wisdom chose not to give these rebels a second chance. After all, they were all in the very presence of and had access to God himself. There is no faith involved, no doubts. They saw God every day, anytime they wanted to. This rebellion was their conscious choice to overthrow God, their creator, in favor of Lucifer. He must have really been something. There is no possible forgiveness for Lucifer and his angelic rebels. God created hell and the lake of fire to be their final place of punishment and judgment. There to be incarcerated forever, eternally separated from the presence of God and anything else. But God's final judgment of Lucifer and his cohorts have been delayed. And these fallen angels still have access to heaven God and the earth. And if you doubt that, uh, read the book of Job, which talks about 
what's going on with Job and Satan going up before God and saying, hey, you know, this and this and this and this and this about Job. He's not kicked out of heaven. He and his angels still are up there. They have access. Why God's allow it? Probably because keeping them up there is a lot better than letting them run free on the earth 100% of the time. But I don't know. I don't know for sure. The book of Revelation of Jesus Christ, chapter 12, also tells us that there's a time that is yet future when this war is going to break out in heaven between the good angels and Satan and his fallen angels. Then Michael and his loyal angels will force Lucifer and the fallen angels out of heaven, and they're never going to be there to return. Unfortunately, guess where they're coming? They're coming to earth. They will be restricted to the earth. And Revelation chapter 12 says, hey, and the devil knows it, and he knows his time is short, and all hell is breaking loose on the earth during the last half of the tribulation period. For three and a half years, it's going to be so bad, it's going to be worse than any other time ever. And unless those days have been cut short, no life would remain on the entirety of the earth. This is going to happen during the second half of the seven-year Great Tribulation. Until then, Lucifer, Satan, and the rest of the heavenly rebels are at war with God. And we, humanity, are the great prize that's at stake. We're the ones they're fighting over. God wants every human being to be saved and to be with him in paradise forever. He died for us. What more could he do? Satan wants to spoil God's plan for the redemption of humanity and drag as many souls as possible down to hell with him just to spite God. This is who we are warring against. Guzik said, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. This describes the purpose of for the strength of God and the armor of God and what we are to use them for. God has given his people a call, a mission, a course to fulfill. Satan will do his best to stop it. When he attacks and intimidates, we are to stand. We are due to Lord's work and to stand against every hint of spiritual opposition. And what did God call us to do? What are we here for? We're to reach out and we are to be God's ambassador to spread the good news to fallen humanity. God has chosen to use us. He could have used angels. He could have used anything else. But he's chosen to use us, fallen people, to fight this spiritual warfare and to carry out his task, which he wants to redeem humanity and he wants to use us to help him to do it. He could have chose many other ways, but this is the one he chose. In verses 14 and 15, Paul starts to tell us about the armor of God. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We can only stand firm when we are properly equipped with the armor of God. This armor is symbolic but each individual piece is important and has its own purpose. Paul was very familiar with weapons and armor. As at, as at the time he wrote this epistle, he was in the custody of Rome. And he was guarded by Roman soldiers. He probably looked at them and studied their armament. And as he looked at them intently, he related it to the weapons of warfare we need as Christians. When he says, having girded your loins, that relates to the belt that the soldiers wore to hold up their garments, which in those days were robes. The belt was to gird up your loins. It was not actually a weapon or a piece of the armor, but girding up your loins or waist allowed the soldiers' robes to be properly secured so that they wouldn't get under in his way of his freedom of movement. Some weapons like swords were also attached to a soldier's belt. 
This belt is described by the scriptures as the belt of truth. It's our faith. It consists of all that we can know and understand of the word of God. In John 17, verses 13 through 17, Jesus prayed aloud to God the Father for his disciples. And that includes us. He prayed for us too at the same time. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world so that they may know my joy made full in themselves. This is Jesus praying at the Last Supper right after it to God, the Father. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they're not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And what has Pastor Joe taught us all in the last three weeks? He taught us about the truth that's in the scriptures, the truth in the Old Testament, the truth in the New Testament, truth in prophecy. For anybody who is an objective person, the truth of God is crystal clear and can be well known if you open your heart up to it. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, the breastplate was an essential piece of the armor. It acted as a protection for the chest and vital organs. The righteousness that the Christian must put on is not of ourselves. Because as the scriptures tell us in Romans 3, verse 10, there is none righteous, not even one. Guzik commented, no, this is not our own earned righteousness. Not a feeling of righteousness, but a righteousness received by faith in Jesus. It gives us a general sense of confidence and awareness of our standing and our position. Even the best good works that we have ever done fall far short of the requirements of perfection that God demands. You know, if you want to try to come to God on the basis of good works, guess what? You have to be perfect. And I don't think any of us here qualify. In fact, I know we don't. In fact, God in the scriptures describes our best good works that you've ever done as filthy rags. So the righteousness that we must put on is that of Christ. God alone is righteous. But when we come to faith in God and Jesus Christ, Repenting of our sins and believing the gospel, God imputes the righteousness of Christ to us. He looks at Scotty and says, man, that is one righteous dude. Not, that's because of the righteousness of Christ that he has received through his faith. And I could have said somebody else's name up here instead of Scotty. I'm not picking on you in any way. Oh, maybe we need to go over that whole husband-wife thing again. <laughs> Having shod your feet, sorry, Joni, hope you're listening. <laughs> Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Shoes or sandals are an essential part of a soldier's armor. There is no way to fight effectively with bare feet. Your feet need protection. The gospel is our protection to enter the fight. It is the preparation for all that we do in regards to spiritual warfare. A commentator said this, The gospel provides the, fo the footing for us. However powerful the rest of your body is, if you are wounded in your feet, you are easy prey for the enemy. We must be mobile, flexible, and ready with the truth. To live the Christian life is to live in constant vigilance readiness, and flexibility. In verses 16 through 18, Paul talks more about the various pieces of armor. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, there's that prayer thing again. And with this in view, be on the alert 
with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. So we're to pray for one another, just like we get these prayer requests on Sunday, huh? So we can all pray for one another. Paul just told us about the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, and that we must shod our feet with firm foundation of the gospel of peace. There are three more parts of the armor. They are in addition to the belt, breastplate, and shoes. They are the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. The shield that Paul describes is not just a small shield. Remember back when we were kids? and We'd go outside and we'd grab a galvanated, a galvanized cover from a garbage can. That was our shield and we'd pick up a stick. That was our sword and we'd have little sword fights. I don't see anybody nodding their head. Nobody else do this beside me. I know I put many a dent in a garbage can lid. <laughs> it's not that kind of shield. It's not the small little shield that Paul's talking about. It's a full body shield. Bruce said, the shield Paul describes is not the small round one, but the large oblong shield that could protect the whole body. Now the Romans used to have a formation where they would stand real close to each other and they would take these long shields and they would be right next to each other and they'd lock all four sides of them and they were like and over the top and they were like an imp they couldn't be attacked. They were like an impenetrable, impenetrable object. The shield Paul describes like I said, is not the small round one, but the large oblong shield that could protect the whole body. In ancient warfare, the fiery darts were launched in great numbers at the beginning of an attack. These are arrows, you know, like you see in the Western movies where the Indians are shooting flaming arrows, except these weren't shot by Indians. These were shot by other, other people. The idea was not only to injure the enemy, but to shoot and at him from all sides with a massive number of arrows and thus to confuse and panic the enemy. Even when such a missile was caught by the shield and did not penetrate to the body, it caused panic because it was thrown when well alighted and its motion through the air made it, a, made it blaze most ferociously. You can imagine shooting an arrow and as it's going through the air, the air the, is the oxygen is feeding the flames and you got fiery darts flying at you, hitting you, in the, hitting you even in the shield. It caused panic. So that the soldier was tempted to get rid of his burning shield and expose himself to the enemy's spear thrusts. Remember, these shields weren't probably made of metal. That would have been too heavy. They were probably made of leather and other stuff like that. Maybe some parts were wood. But they could burn, you know, so these fiery darts could hit it. And eventually, they would probably start on fire. But the shield of faith not only catches the incendiary devices, but it extinguishes them. Thoughts, feelings, imaginations, fears, and lies, all of these can be hurled at us by Satan as fiery darts. Anybody else have any fiery darts ever shot at them? Faith turns them back. Our knowledge of the scriptures and belief in the truth of the word of God together with our faith allows us to turn back the accusations and lies of the enemy. The helmet is a vital piece of armor as it protects the head. Paul says that our helmets are to be helmets of salvation. Salvation must be our sure hope. The enemy loves to discourage and attack us concerning our salvation. Remember, we are eternally saved, but while we are in this body of flesh, we still have a sin nature. I won't say if we sin, rather the truth is when we sin, right? Rather, yeah, Satan may then whisper in your ear something like this. Look what you just did. How could you do that? Do you call yourself a Christian? You're a fraud. You're a failure. How could God still love you when you just did that? Just give up. Forget all this Christian nonsense. When those thoughts of the enemy come to mind, we must have firmly fixed in the core of our being the certainty of our salvation. 
Here at Calvary, we teach that once you're saved, you're always saved. You cannot lose your salvation. But there is a, a caveat to this. To be truly saved means to come to a knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, to repent and to believe the gospel. You must believe that the sacrifice of Christ on the cross of Calvary paid for your sins, past, present, and future, and not for only your sins, but for the sins of the entire world. And that Christ died and then rose from the dead three days later, proving that he was God and that his sacrifice was acceptable to the Father. That's why he appeared to so many witnesses after he was crucified. They saw him. They saw him back to life. It's indisputable fact of history. Proving that God accepted what he did. The scriptures plainly teach that salvation is not obtained by works or good deeds. Your works or good deeds contribute zippo to your salvation. It's through faith and belief in what Jesus has done for us. That's what saves you. Just as before, just before he gave up his spirit on the cross, Jesus said in triumph, it's finished. The price for the sins of all mankind, past, present, and future, had been paid in full. As it was then, so it is now. Jesus said in John 3.16, which you guys all know, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And if it's eternal, can you lose it? If you can lose it, it's not eternal, is it? Our salvation is assured us by the promises of God. Paul said in Romans 8, 31 through 39, What then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but deliver him over for all of us, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who, is the one who condemns us? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, and he intercedes for us. Pretty nice, huh? Our defense attorney is sitting right next to God the Father, interceding for us. So our salvation is permanent. Once you're saved, you're always saved. If you're born again, salvation is your helmet. Guzik said the helmet of salvation protects us against discouragement, against the desires to give up, giving us hope not only in knowing that we are saved, but that we will be saved. It is the assurance that God will triumph. Evil's not going to win. They're toast. Jesus has beat them. It's just a matter of time. We will be finishing up today with the last part of the armor, which is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Remember, Pastor Joe, he beat it into us for the last three weeks. The Word, the Word, the Old Testament, the New Testament, prophecy, the Word of God is true. Amen. It's vitally important that we not only know the Scriptures, but believe that they're true and the actual words of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, and Pastor Joe uses this a lot, I'm going to use it too, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man and woman of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. The idea behind the sword of the Spirit is that the sword is an offensive weapon. It represents the word of God, but it's only effective if we have a firm belief and are confident that the totality of the scriptures are indeed inspired by God. We can't pick and choose. You know, we can't say, I'll take this one from column A and I'll take this one from column B and skip column C. It doesn't work that way. It's either all right or, or you can't trust any of it. Who are we? Who am I? Who are you? To say, oh, I believe this part, but I don't believe this part. How do we know what's true? 
It's either all true or none of it's true. You can't trust it. It's true. We must also take the sword of the Spirit in the sense of depending that he helps us to use it. Not only did the Spirit give us the scriptures, but also he makes them alive to us, or us alive to them, and he equips us with the right thrust of the sword at the right time. You know, give you just the right words to say at the right time for that situation that you need them. Practicing sword thrust and moves and positions. That's what the gladiator and the soldier did during their training. They practiced. We must practice them ahead of time. And if, he, if he's a superior fighter and has a great fighting instinct at the time of battle, he will instantly recall which thrust, which position suits the precise moment that you're in. He'll never be able to use the thrust in the fight if he has not first practiced it, but he still needs to make the move at the right moment of time. So that's the illusion here that we're to practice. You know, we're not just supposed to, like I said before, just sit back and, oh, oh I'm saved. Oh, God will do what he's going to do. You know, he wants to use you. He wants you to be active. I'll finish with this. Paul ends this section on the armor of God in verses 18 through 20 by telling us how we're to use it. Praying, always with all power, with prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador. And you too are ambassadors. But Paul is an ambassador in chains that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Prayer is the key in the battle we face against the power of darkness. Effective prayer is the heavy artillery in our fight. Prayer is how the Christian enters the fray. We can say that it is through prayer that spiritual strength and the armor of God go to work. A Christian, Christian can be strong and wearing all the armor but never accomplish anything because he fails to go into battle through prayer. Next time, we're going to cover this more fully, but uh, I'm going to finish up with that today. You're never going to accomplish anything unless you go into battle through prayer. That's what it's all about. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for these wonderful scriptures. We covered a whole bevy of topics this morning from the marriage relationship, children, submission, slaves and masters, workers and employers, all the things that you've done for us, Lord, and because of that, uh, you equip us to do spiritual battle. And we talked about the weapons. We talked about what the battle's all about, who we're battling, and that we, the souls of men and women, are the great prize that the fight's all over. We thank you that you put these dark, evil powers to open display, and they've lost, Lord. Praise you for what you have done, for what you did on that cross. Though it appeared to be weakness, it was your crowning achievement of your life here uh, on this earth. We thank you and we praise you for that. In Jesus' name.